our our peace president was actually uh, perform uh, being going to be the master of ceremonies, and she had this uh, technologically down to a virtuoso performance, and she uh, had a death in the family last night, and literally left in the middle of the night uh, to go be with her family in Mexico. So, um, so if you'll forgive our technological faux pas, um, you'll love the speakers. That's all I can say. Um, our next, our next pair, uh, and they will have, uh, a full half hour. Um, we we actually built a break in after them, so it's not even going to hurt anything. Um, and if you all would like to turn on your screen so that the speakers can see real faces, that'd be awesome too. Um, but uh, our next speakers are um, Dr. Luis Mendoza and Lance Graham. Dr. Um, Oh, I've got a, I've got, I never can remember what you're the director of, because I think it's the longest title in, in the, in the whole area issue system. I don't know, maybe uh, the school of mathematical and statistical sciences is competing with you. But uh, so let me see how this goes. Um, so it's, he is, Dr. Mendoza has worked in the prisons for a long time elsewhere, um, but he is, the, he is the current Penn Project Director and, uh, and the Director of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies on the, on the West Campus, where Lance uh, is also full-time English faculty. And, um, and as well as formerly incarcerated. Um, and, and I, they work with Leah Weed at the, um, she's the, the prison liaison who gathers the uh, writing from the, uh, the prisoners there who are writers and uh, sends it to Dr. Mendoza and, and to, uh, to Lewis and to Graham. And um, she just says how wonderful it has been to work with them and, and their interns. And I'll let them, of course, explain more of what they do. But um, so you have uh, the full, how about 32 minutes <laughs> to talk about the pen project and, and whatever else you'd like to address, actually. Okay, so, thank you very much, Corey. And thanks to everybody for being here. And thank you so much for inviting uh, Dr. Huggins, uh, Professor Huggins to be with us today. That was, that was amazing. And uh, what a great compliment and how uh, important. So, uh, and again, I also want to start off by saying how much we very much appreciate being able to inherit this fantastic, uh, pro the PIN project, a fantastic program that was developed by faculty here, which has been shepherded by Corey for a number of years before coming over to us this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity. And I, I want to also publicly thank Lance for noticing that it was about to be, uh, disappear unless we rose up to the occasion to uh, take it on. And I'm, I'm so happy that uh, you worked with us to make sure that that happened to preserve it because it is a very, very important project. And uh, we have been able to, one of the benefits of bringing it over to our campus is that uh, there was such a strong following of uh, students of English and Tempe that they have not stopped signing up for this class. Mm -hmm. And now uh, it really elevated the awareness among our students and also students in the uh, social justice and human rights program on the West Campus. So they have become part of this. And we've opened it up to, um, well, it was already opened up, but we, I, I, I core students, O core students, and both programs. And so we do A, B, and C sessions. And, mm. uh, it's, and uh, we have a really sizable number. And uh, in fact, I've also, one of the other things I've taken on uh, was trying to reconnect with the Arizona Department of Corrections to have them come back and join the program. And we, was very happy that just this past week, I finally received a reply after a couple of times of reaching out. And I think they have some concerns they want to talk with us about, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that this means they will join us because with as many students as we have signing up, but we have already for the fall, about 60 students signed up to be interns. Uh, we want to make sure we have plenty of work for them. And uh, I think certainly, unfortunately, uh, there really is enough talented writers out there who are incarcerated that could use the uh, uh, feedback. We just need to connect with them and do our job to expand the program. Now, it was uh, <clears throat> my understanding, and please forgive me if I'm wrong, because I'm happy to talk about the Penn Project, but I, uh, my understanding from the letter from uh, Leslie was that we wanted to make a personal connection to being invested in doing this work. Is that right? Yes. Okay. 
So uh, I'm going to try and be very quick here and not take too much time. But um, reality is, I, I, in many ways, have been, uh, I grew up in a working class inner city neighborhood in Houston, Texas. And uh, it was hard not to grow up there in a minoritized community and not in some way have constant contact with the criminal justice system. I mean, our communities were police. We were constantly harassed. It was just a typical part of learning how to drive was learning how to tolerate the stop and frisk and to be uh, really be to understand that you should, you can't be oversensitive to be under suspicion because if you uh, spoke back to these police too much, they would push it as a junior in high school um, is when a uh, Jose Campos Torres was killed by a policeman and thrown in one of the bayous. And this would led to uh, major public riots in Houston at the time. But this is in my radar screen as I'm coming of age and was something that I was always worried about. And it was in that sense for me, uh, my parents, fortunately I had parents who really, really believed in the value of education and always pushed that for us and tried to, as much as possible to send us to private schools because the public school system, and this is evidenced simply by my friends in the neighborhood and so many people around me, it was uh, oftentimes, you know, it was a push out policy. You either, there was a lot of uh, uh, racial profiling. There was a lot of challenges, a lot of violence in the schools. And many of my, many of my friends I grew up with did not continue, did not even graduate from high school and certainly were not uh, treated as college bound material. That didn't mean it was easy in the in the private school system. I went to an all boys Catholic school that was uh, the racial climate there was very problematic. And in fact, I graduated with college scholarships, but told myself if this was and it was a college prep school. I said, if this is college prep, I don't want to go because I had experienced so much harassment from my teachers and fellow students that I just couldn't see why I would want to continue this and pay for it uh, for four, four more years. So it did take me a few years to get back into the school system. And I started with community college and evening schools and eventually received a PhD after many years. But fortunately, in my first year of graduate school at the University of Texas in Austin, I had heard about a local uh, bookstore in the east side of Austin. Again, a kind of a dense, very densely populated black and brown community. Uh, book, it's where a little bookstore sat that, you know, you had to kind of figure out when they were open because it wasn't consistent, but it was called the Desistencia Books, and that it was owned and run by a former, uh, formerly incarcerated individual uh, named Raul Salinas, who was a very well-known poet whose work I had encountered as a college student at the University of Houston. And I also, at the time, was volunteering with a arts organization called La Pena there in Austin, and I'd been asked to go there and pick to, uh, he, he worked with an organization called uh, Lucha, the League of United Chicano Artists, and to go to there and pick up some poems for him to include in our newsletter. And, and that's when I had an opportunity to meet him. And it was not necessarily an easy meeting. He was suspicious of anybody affiliated with the university uh, and kind of wouldn't even look me in the eye, like, didn't bother, like he didn't want to bother with me. But, you know, I got to talking to him and told him I'd heard about his bookstore and I'd heard about these uh, readings that he would do that were called, uh, it was under the series of, you know, poesias, you know, poetry of the streets. And he would hold poetry readings in cantinas and restaurants and other places. And I asked, I told him I wanted to see his bookstore. So over a period of years, I developed a very close relationship with him, volunteered at the bookstore, built him bookshelves, uh, just really committed myself to working with him and perhaps more uh, significantly, not only did we become friends and I think mutual teachers, as he always say, I, I really taught him a lot about academic discourse and he taught me a lot about life and about the life of incarcerated people. But he, he, uh, he had spent about 11 years uh, in prison from the late 50s to the early 70s and four different prisons, everywhere from Soledad State Penitentiary in California, Huntsville State Prison in uh, used in Huntsville, Texas, um, uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas, and then Marion Federal Penitentiary in Illinois. Uh, and, and he sort of saw, when he looked back, he saw his uh, trajectory as that each of these taught him something. He said, this is like high school. This is like grad, getting my MA here. This is like getting my PhD. Because each, he success, uh, 
over time is where he honed his craft of writing. And he became a really well-known poet in uh, prison in the, uh, and a participant in the Chicano movement because many prisoners were advocating for civil rights movements to take on uh, the criminal justice system and the prison industrial complex as a major civil rights issue at the time. Uh, but his experience was such that he was in prison throughout, as you can imagine, the 60s and 70s, and he was also incarcerated with quite a number, especially in the federal penitentiary, incarcerated with uh, a number of um, political prisoners who really re-educated re him, as he says, and helped him really turn from a, uh, what we might call a social prisoner to a political prisoner. And he was classified eventually as a political prisoner because of his organizing in uh, Leavenworth and Marion and was moved to Fer Marion, which had become the supermax prison at the time. And, uh, and he remained a leader there, led strikes, uh, but also <clears throat> earned his parole because quite a number of professors across the country helped advocate for his release because of his value as an artist and the fact that his mindset had really changed. Uh, and again, he was, he, was, he was a social critic, but not necessarily, not necessarily a social rebel in terms of against capitalism and, or selling drugs, which is the two things that had mostly uh, got him incarcerated in the first place. And I wrote, I worked with Raul over the years to publish uh, four different books, uh, including the collection of his writings. And when in his bookstore, I learned that he had a um, amazing, he had a little, a, a second bathroom that wasn't being used that was piled to the ceiling with boxes and boxes of his letters from prison and writings and all kinds of stuff. And um, like a lot of prisoners, he, he was to some extent a, um, a pack rat and he saved everything and sent it out. And he, um, I looked at these and as a, PhD student in English, I'm like, well, my God, this is a valuable archive. And so over the years, I worked with him and uh, myself and a friend of mine who was at Stanford made the case that Stanford University should acquire his archives. And uh, here's a man who was living, was so happy when he started getting Social Security because he finally had a steady paycheck because he became more committed to running that bookstore as a, not really, a, I mean, it, he didn't have a lot of titles there, but it was more of a gathering place. It was more of a cultural and political center and uh, and he, uh, you know, we, they they acquired his archives and paid him quite a hefty sum, and he was just blown away that that could even happen that his his life was worth that much. But out of that, we also revisited uh, <clears throat> the archive and produced another book of his early writings out of there. So uh, I learned an enormous amount from him, and with him, I w was able to go into uh, because he remained committed to. Becoming to being an activist, working on behalf of uh, you know social and human rights and social justice issues all, uh, in all kinds of ways, but I also he also was committed to doing prison education and youth intervention programs, and I helped him run workshops in a number of prisons all over the country where he would get invited to speak as a poet, but then they would take him to the local uh, prison to to give a workshop, uh, and he was an amazing, uh, inspiring person and. Really, he's, he's the person who's most responsible for me getting involved in this work and understanding this connection to my early educational experience. Because here was a man who was mostly self-taught, extraordinarily intelligent, but couldn't survive the primary and secondary education uh, system in this country at the time. And even as a young man, just because he wore his hair long or had tattoos, he would get harassed by the police all the time. And in some ways, unfortunately, he was destined to... to have this life, uh, but he turned it around. And, uh, and I always wrote about him as somebody who was, well, yes, I recognize that he was extraordinary in terms of his artistic achievements. He was really a representative of the people in terms of the fact that uh, his life trajectory was similar to so many others. And I wanted people to see him as a, a major example of not only the power of education, but the power of social critique, the power of activism, uh, and the importance of continuing to uh, reform and change and hopefully one day eradicate the prison industrial complex. So I want to not go on too much further. I want to let Lance talk, uh, but again, I want to appreciate my, uh, extend my appreciation to Lance for making sure that we're 
continued, that were part of this project and this important work here at ASU now. Could, could I say one thing right before we get to Lance and this is why? I had no idea you were from Houston and that's where I grew up mm -hmm. and I got my uh, master's degree at U of H and uh, they have a great Latinx press there, the Arte Publico Press, it's phenomenal. D not dedicated to, to prison writing, but it's a really great press. But uh, I, I actually went to Deer Park High School and, and I just want to corroborate, when you and I were growing up, uh, there were no black students in my school district, period. They just didn't, you know, the, 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 the separations were that definitive of where people lived back then. And, and maybe a handful of Latinx students. I mean, I can remember them because yeah. they're like, you know, maybe one in every third class that you took or something. And I just can't imagine how difficult that would have been um, but I'd also like to recommend kind of tying you in with Erica Huggins' uh, discussion of how um, slavery fed into the, um, into the uh, uh, current prison complex. And, um, and, and that is the, the book, Texas Tough. Have you read that one? No, it's, I haven't. It's a phenomenal book, and it gives a wider history than just Texas, but it really explains how that occurred and uh, and how how racial it, it it is. You know, the justice so. Yeah, I was glad to see that you pointed out the uh, relationship between the plantation system and the prison system, and mm -hmm. I certainly was aware of that throughout the South. Yep. Uh, many of the prisons are built on the sites of former plantations, and. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that Angola had been a plantation. It just, I didn't get that far in, in, into Angola's history. But yeah, I mean, that's just, it's so clear how the, how the races were funneled that way. You know, it's, it's just terrible. But okay, I'm, I'm done. Texas Tough, if you want to read it, anybody, it's a, it tells you the whole prison system. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a, it's horrible. It's, it all took place right where I was growing up, um, you know, and I, I was so unaware as a kid because there I was in this white community. Why would I know this stuff? Right. So uh, I was just dumb. So, okay, Lance, please. <laughs> All right. So first off, thank you, Corey, for this opportunity, for this invite. And thank you again for uh, helping us get the pen project here. Um, I just want to start with that before I get into my personal and essentially, so I, I have taught a session of the pen. I have actually have a class under my belt at this point. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what to expect going in. Um, it was the first time that I shared my background with my students um, because of the relevancy of it. And, you know, um, kind of what I realized is the idea of giving feedback. Some of us feel better prepared to do so. Some of us are hesitant. We don't feel we have those qualifications. So. Luckily, we got all those wonderful documents that you gave us. Um, I spent a good significant time covering those. Reinforcing the importance of all this is the idea of what we're here for, and that is to give feedback and instruction to our inmate writers. Um, so going into it, not really knowing what to expect, I was blown away. Um, so the students, uh, the semester, so I'm, I'm, I've taught one semester at a session. I'm halfway well over halfway through the rest of the semester and the students have went all out um they have really taken what we have put on their plate and the responsibility and really taken ownership of it um a short poem eight lines gets three to eight pages of feedback um and what they aren't able to provide they go through and building on the recommendations finding literature finding further learning opportunities for for our inmate writers um, and it just has blown me away. Um, seeing how much my students have taken on this responsibility and how much they care. Um, it just really has been the, I guess, the capping of all this, um, the icing on the cake, I guess you can say. So now that that is out there, uh, so thank you again, Corey. Um, my background, so uh, this is a very personal project for me. Um, so I grew up low income um, area in Phoenix. I'm a Phoenix native, born and raised. Uh, I grew up in the Maryville 
uh, community of Phoenix, Arizona, inner city, low income. And I grew up, um, I'm 40 years old, so I grew up kind of coming to age in the 90s, um, a period that was marked by uh, the gang culture and the drug culture. So I came up um, kind of in the midst of all that. Um, I came up in an environment that predominantly was not white. Um, my peers in elementary, my peers throughout junior high were either Hispanic or African-American. Um, all of the people that I call family, that I call close friends to this day um, are African-American. So I grew up in a culture that didn't necessarily represent the culture that you see when you meet me. Um, and I grew up dealing with those same issues of trying to survive, but also understanding at some point I was going to prison. Um, the environment had allowed me to understand that early on. So it was no secret uh, by age 13, I had already committed to the idea that someday I was going to be calling prison home. Um, and part of that was from age five to 17, I was visiting my uncle in and out of prison. Um, my first experience with prison was going to visit him for the first 12 years of my life, essentially, um, because he unfortunately was one of those people who went to prison and fell into the trap that it creates for us. And that trap for me is recidivism. Um, he spent my most of my childhood in and out of prison, um, not because he was a bad person, but because he had issues with drugs. Um, he did not know how to overcome those issues. And then prison, unfortunately, uh, was the one place that he could find a place to sober up. I mean, there was times he actually went back to prison just because of that opportunity. So that was my first experience, going to visit him. And then the environment we grew up in, um, if I was to count 10 friends on my hands, I would be able to name nine of them that have been in prison. Uh, college really wasn't a foresight of mine. Um, I never even knew that college was even a realistic opportunity. Uh, it kind of came to be after my release, after my release and after spending five years in Arizona State Prison, I realized that their goal is to keep me there. Their goal is to keep me coming back. Um, I didn't really know at that time, I'll be honest, how to not do that. They did not prepare me. They did not provide anything to prepare me for success, to prepare me for uh, coming home and dealing with the obstacles that I was going to face once I was home. Um, so I got out of prison and I realized, what do I do? I didn't really have any options. I didn't really even have a a basis on what to do. Um, one thing I did know is while I was incarcerated, we got a lot of those late night commercials, DeVry University. Uh, so on a whim, I had always had my mom telling me that's all she wanted was me to go to college. Um, a hardworking, for the most part, single parent um, who provided. And that was her answer for how we improve our lives. Even though she wasn't a college graduate, she didn't know too many people who had went to college. She just knew from her perspective, that's how you change your life. So with that in mind, I decided on a whim to go up to DeVry, figured it would get me off parole. It would get me from going back right away um, to the system that tried to um, keep me there. And I went and enrolled in school. Um, a rough patch, cost me a lot of money starting out at DeVry, but it put me on the pathway to where I am today. So from DeVry, I ended up transferring to the community college once the community college planning on studying business, planning on getting a background that uh, I could employ and work for myself. Uh, part of that studying was also going there with an open mind and being open to other opportunities. One of those opportunities that presented itself was a literature 101 course. Um, my first English literature class, my first English college class, and it exposed me to what literature can do. Um, so the story in particular was A Soldier Home uh, by Ernest Hemingway, uh, a soldier about a, a story about a soldier returning home and trying to readjust to society from a place that was very different than most people in society understood that readjustment. That spoke so many ways to what I was going through. Um, at that point, I had been home just over a year by the time I got to GCC. I had just finished my parole. And I was still very much readjusting, trying to figure out what my purpose was in a world that um, had tried to define it for me. It had tried to tell me that I was meant to go back. 
Um, so from there, from that course, I had decided I wanted to study English. Um, and I switched my major. I declared uh, to study the field of English. So I worked hard, uh, got to where I am from kind of taking on that field of study, but also in the meantime, studying everything I could to learn about prison, um, prison studies, uh, statistics. And one of the first things I learned at GCC was the term recidivism. Uh, I allowed that to then define my choices going forward, um, making sure that I would not be a statistic. Um, so here I am today, uh, a month out from being 13 years free. Um, here I am today uh, teaching at Arizona State University. And the reason that came to be was one, this wonderful campus, the wonderful people who have been an influence to me. Um, I let my past not be a secret, I opened up to my professors, to the people that I started to build relationships with. Um, and then they got to see my level of effort and work and committing to, um, I guess, developing an expertise in what I do. Uh, so from there, I really just worked along, adding to my repertoire when it comes to English, to writing, to literature. Um, as a grad student, I was given my first exposure to uh, the field of prison literature. Um, Dr. Mendoza, he had taught his course here, which was his prison lit course. Um, and then it was with that experience that I realized that there is a place out here for our voices. Um, other than that, my experience was my voice was meant and stifled and silenced. So I didn't really understand that people actually wanted to hear about our experiences inside. So from there, um, everything just started falling in place. And initially I had met Corey um, going to learn about Iron City Magazine. Um, Iron City Magazine was something that I was very intrigued in. At the time with a colleague, we were discussing trying to get a literary magazine in motion um, for marginalized voices because my focus was I can include prisoners and also anybody else who needs to be heard. So going to meet Corey, uh, Dr. Wells introduced me to the other aspect of what she was doing with the uh, prison education program and the pen project. So without going to learn about her magazine, I might not have never discovered what was actually occurring with the pen project. So from that, um, I just kept adding to my repertoire of understanding both literature and the field of prison studies. Uh, the opportunity came. Uh, she, I reached out to Corey and she helped us get the pen project here. So for me, the pen project represents something vital, something that is needed a lot more than it is given. And that is a, a program of rehabilitation. So my prison experience was essentially getting locked in a concrete, to concrete tomb until my release date. Um, I was not given any beneficial programming uh, so I went into college, I mean, I went into prison with an eighth grade edu education. I dropped out in the eighth grade, uh, flirted with high school, but never completed a full year. Um, I kind of knew my path in life at that time, and I had fully committed to that. So I dropped out in the eighth grade from age 15 until 24 when I went into prison. I had kind of lived in and out of the streets, um, in and out of uh, different situations that do not put us on this pathway. So. I got to prison, finally arrived at where I expected to arrive at. And I realized that the goal for us in there was to create lifelong prisoners. The goal for us in there was to create a system that recycles us, that constantly brings us back. Um, so, and aside from that, there was no benefit to us. We were literally thrown in concrete and told to wait on that release date. I, I could not stand that. Um, coming from a culture that was not my own, coming from a culture where all of my friends, all of my close friends are of an opposite race. Um, I had to deal head on with the racial politics in there, um, which also reinforced how much I hated the situation I found myself in. So what I chose to do since prison did not provide it was chose to start figuring out and reflecting on my life and my choices and how do I improve those? I got out, College was the only logical choice I could come up with, um, not knowing I even qualified for loans, for funding, any of that until I got there. Uh, and then from there, it was just one trajectory of 
making sure I did not become a statistic of recidivism, making sure that I had to self-rehabilitate. Because um, again, prison did not give us anything. The one class I was given in there was a cultural diversity class, which would come tell us the importance of a diverse culture and then send us back to Jim Crow conditions. Um, didn't really make much sense. And it was more of a laughing joke that was running through the yard than any type of beneficial programming. So with that in mind, I kind of got out and realized what is needed. Um, and what is needed, unfortunately, is for us to find a way to rehabilitate ourselves, find avenues that allow us to stay free, which is not easy. Um, society itself does not offer second chances. And that ties in, again, to the importance of the Penn Project. Um, the Penn Project is not something that is offered as much as I think it should. As Lewis touched on, our, his goal has been trying to get more people involved, allowing us to get our interns working with more prisoners. And I personally uh, have been doing a lot of studying this past couple months of prison education. Um, and the one thing it's reinforced is what I already know is we need prison education on a much wider scale. Now, to me, that means a lot of different things, but we need opportunities of rehabilitation, and that's what's not provided. Programs like us, like PEP, um, we are on the ground providing opportunities that otherwise would not be present. Um, so with that, kind of what I see us doing is the most vital way to create change on the inside, and that is offering programming that allows people to grow, allows people to express themselves, whether it's personal, whether it's working through things. Writing allows a lot of opportunities for change. Writing a lot allows a lot of opportunities for growth. And we're developing that. We're giving that benefit of, I think, what I would hope would start to become a cycle of self-rehabilitating. And then when we get out, that's, that's where the difficulties continue. We need something throughout the country, throughout the nation, state by state, offering second chances. Um, when you come home, you're told where you can live, where you can work. You essentially have handcuffs put on your dreams. You're told, go work construction, go work labor. Um, the other things aren't really given. Um, so you have to learn to fight and just not give up those dreams that have been handcuffed and you have to get out and kind of make them happen. So I would like to see society implement some kind of second chance opportunity for all people who have been incarcerated. And that doesn't mean just you go to prison, you come out and life starts over. No, I understand the idea of proving ourselves. So some type of timeline, allowing our current writers to come home and then maybe see that they can continue building on what they are given in prison that is rehabilitative rather than just coming home, being told where to work, being told you got to pay a PO, being told, oh, you can't live here. You can only live in slump. You can only live in uh, low income housing. So I think that's kind of what I see us doing. We are planting that first seed of change when our inmates get to not only get writing instruction, get to write, get somebody to hear it and to listen to them. Um, but then they get that wonderful instruction that I've been seeing all semester. It gives them hope. It gives them hope that they can be more than a cog in a system, than a prison, than a prisoner, than somebody who essentially in today's society is um, much like a, a soda can meant to be recycled. So that's what I see the Penn Project doing, planting seeds for change, planting seeds that allow our interns to grow and realize the importance of this, which uh, I realized from the first cycle of submissions, they understood that. And then second, to create opportunities by planting some seeds within these inmate minds. Um, and that's kind of how I connect to the PEM project. So uh, with that, thank you. I, I think that was very enlightening, both of, both of your stories um, and why people get involved in, in prison education. For me, it was a chance conversation one day with a colleague. Uh, and then I was just so appalled by the situation nationally. I mean, if you put all the prisoners in one state, it'd be the 36th largest state in the country. I mean, we're just, we, we incarcerated at an appalling rate. Um, and uh, 
Um, I, I think we could take one or two questions uh, for you for you guys if that if you want to answer um, and uh, from people if, if someone has a question. Um, I, I, uh, I had something I wanted to say and it's now gone so uh, it'll come back to me at an inappropriate moment. <laughs> Any questions for this panel. I think I think the thing I wanted to say, if a question doesn't pop up, is um, so you mentioned the the really difficult adjustments after you get out, and so within ten years, seventy five percent of prisoners have gone back. Uh, most of them, sixty seven percent within like three years, something like that, um, and. Uh, and, and the problem is that they get out, they can't find a place to live, they can't get a job, they're denied food stamps, so they're often going hungry, literally. Um, they can't vote in most states. Um, and if they can vote, they have to go through so much rigmarole to do it. While you're in prison, if you had a, a car loan or something while you were when you were arrested, it's going to accrue interest while you're inside and you're going to be stuck with that when you get out. I mean, so I think in a way it's important for people to know that any prison sentence, one year, any felony conviction is a life sentence. You never get to pay. You know, we say, oh, you got to, you do the crime, you, you know, you do the time, you pay for your crime. That's just a, nobody ever gets to pay in America for crime or what we deem as crime or criminal behavior. Nobody gets to do that. It's a life sentence. And that, that's just appalling to me in every possible way. Any questions for these two? If not, we'll move on. I have a question though. Yes. Uh, I wonder how do we, so I'm very happy that we're promoting education for uh, ex-prisoners and it's an amazing idea, but I have concerns, especially hopping on on the topic we just heard how can we promote education if people don't know even where to live and what to eat? It seems like when I'm trying to promote education, I just kind of stepping over in a huge problem and pretending it's not there when I'm saying, hey, don't be afraid, go to college, I will help you. But then how about where to live, where to, where to work and what to eat? How do we help with that? And can we help? Well, for me, it would be a much longer process. When I say education, I don't mean strictly college education. I mean life skills, um, skills that allow the inmates to get out and succeed. And yes, education programs as well, but education, so writing, writing offers so many different angles for improvement, whether it's self-expression, whether it's, it's writing through your own things you need to deal with in life. Um, and then from there, I don't really see it as just get in and start pushing college educations, but get in there and, and some kind of opportunity to learn different things. So, and that's one thing that Pep was doing. Pep was going in and shocking to my understanding was giving all these different type of classes that weren't for credit, but were more to allow people to see what they could do and hopefully plant a seed of possibility. So, that's what I think we need. And to me, it's, it's much more than just education. It's like you touched on life skills, um, understanding how to seek jobs, understanding how to find a place to live, understanding all these different things. And then yes, the education itself. Um, one last thing I would like to add is I believe thoroughly that I serve as proof of education's ability to completely change our lives. Um, the person I went into prison, the person I came home as, was nowhere near the person I've become through education. Mm -hmm. Education has completely recharted my life. And mm -hmm. to say that, I still go around those same people I grew up with. I still go around trying to be a, a beacon of light for them. Um, my best friend, talking about recidivism, he's done double the time I have. Um, we've been friends since we were 13. He is now uh, on his 15th year inside fighting for the rest of his life. So my understanding of what needs done is much more than just education. It's education on how to be citizens, education is how to survive um, as adults in a world that, as we've highlighted, doesn't really want to give us any of that. Inside, they literally teach you nothing. Their, their goal is to get you back. And that's what I learned inside. 
most of the people that I was with, and I was on a higher yard. I was on a on a three three. Um, so a lot of people I was with were doing long sentences, um, and most of them had been in there third, fourth times. It wasn't a lot of first timers, is what I realized. It was a lot of repeat offenders, a lot of people who had recidivated fell into that trap of recidivism and have come back. And now on their third time, they were doing 15 to 20 years for a charge that they originally went to prison for five years for. So maybe that helps. Thank you. That was very good to answer. That's exactly what I was curious about to ask. Thank you. I really like how you said it. Uh, and then uh, someone posted, plant a seed of possibility. It's a really good phrase. I also noticed. It's so smart. And that, I would say that, that the real planting of the seeds need to take place uh, in a child's early life. I mean, and, and if you look at the characteristics that define most prisoners in this country, you'll see certain things with low income, certain things with lack of ed, uh, education. And so we, what's going on in our primary and secondary school system matters. It has direct implications for the criminal justice system because we we feed it. And so there's what uh, many people talk about is the uh, pipeline from schools to prison. You know, because there is no real alternative. It's almost in some communities more likely that you're going to go to prison than you are going to go to college. And so we need to be looking early on at how we're preparing students. And then just go back and touch on what Lance is talking about, you know, in terms of thinking about the importance of literacy. Sure, literacy is about, uh, you know, reading, decoding and the letters and, and being able to read and interpret and uh, writing. But literacy is also, uh, you know, again, one of the great educators of our times, Paolo Freire talked about, it's about really being able to decode relationships between things and society and understand that this action has this consequence or these people have this relationship to the rest of the people or some people are in positions of privilege or the power of money to influence where we invest, you know, our human and social resources. And so literacy really needs to be rethought as really the vehicle to uh, mm -hmm. enable a broader spectrum of freedom for people in our society to have choices. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to have, we have to have presidents care about it. Obama was the first sitting president who ever even set foot in a prison period. They don't even know what's going on. Joe Biden, when he was a Senator from Delaware uh, was, was he wrote the bill that took away the Pell Grant from prisoners. Uh, in the early 90s. Um, but he has since publicly come out and said that was bad policy and he regrets it. So we have somebody that we could, you know, if we can get his ear, I think we could, you know, make some changes. But I don't know. Kamala Harris has put away quite a few people into the prison system. So I don't know. I don't know. It looks like Lindsay Saya has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay, and then we'll move <laughs> to your panel. It'll be a good segue. Great to see you, by the way. Nice to see you too, Corey. Um, uh, this question is uh, for either Lance or Dr. Mendoza. Um, I agree uh, with you, Lance, that education is, is uh, the, one of the best ways, if not the best way, to uh, change a person's life once they are released from prison. I also agree that there is um, a certain script I think that we're meant to follow when we are out of prison. Uh, and I guess my question is, uh, once you were free, I think, did you feel that pressure to follow that script? Which I think is it's existing, right? We feel that pressure to follow the script, to be the laborer, to be, and not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but I think that whatever dreams that we may have, we may have, I think it's kind of scoffed at because we are uh, the ex-convict. So I guess, at what point did you feel like, well, one, was that pressure to kind of conform to that script always present? And did you kind of at times feel to the need to conform, like to abandon whatever uh, educational uh, pathway you might have been on to just kind of conform to that script? Uh, you know, and what was it that made you not conform, I guess? Uh, for me, I still deal with the struggle to conform. I'll be honest. I've been teaching at ASU now. This is um, four years. Uh, I've been in school since the day I got out, essentially. So the 13 years I've been out, I was in school about nine, nine of those years as a student and the last four as a teacher. Um, I still struggle with it. Um, recently, I had to look for a place to live. 
I had to constantly get told I couldn't live somewhere because of my past. Um, I, and I, I threw out there, hey, I teach at ASU. And it, it didn't matter. It cost me money and it cost me a struggle. But I still deal with that. Um, I guess my thought of why I'm not going back and why I haven't went back is the people around me, um, Dr. Mendoza, other of my mentors here at ASU, um, they actually showed me that people care. People care about where I've been and what I'm trying to do. And they encouraged me to essentially not give up. They, they encouraged me to believe in myself and believe in this very different pathway than I ever dreamt of myself. So going to college, going to college was really to show people that I'm more than what they're going to find out about me. Um, that was the original reason first and that I committed to it. I didn't want to just go back and get hit with double digits. Um, I went in the first time under Arizona's kind of three strike law, which is the repeat offender program. I went in my first prison sentence as a repeat offender. I did two sentences my first time in. Um, my first plea bargain when I went in was 10 and a half to 13 years. I went in for a DUI. Um, it got turned into a whole bunch of other things. But at the end of the day, I realized that they wanted to make that my home. And that's kind of what has kept me going. Um, understanding how much I hated prison, how much prison was not meant to nourish me at all. Um, and then understanding their, their plan, their plan was to get me back. That's kind of what kept me from going back. And yes, it still is a struggle. I still haven't thrown out their script or their plan for us um, because society, unfortunately, 13 years free, a college instructor, um, G degrees with 4.0 uh, GPAs, it does not matter. I'm still what gets found when they Google me or look up my background. So that's, I guess, my driving force is recidivism. I don't want to be a statistic. And as Corey highlighted, I actually looked up those numbers recently and I saw something a lot worse. I saw one that said 84% after nine or 10 years, a mm -hmm. uh, more recent version. So mm -hmm. the reality is the industrial complex is as it is because they need bodies. And when society allows them to take somebody and give them these sentences that are made stiffer and longer because they went back to prison again, um, they're creating a population of permanent bodies, a population of permanent profit. So hope that helps. Them. Right. And that's why we spend more money on prisons than we do uh, at K through 12 education is because it's, it's a, uh, it's big business and schools are not. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. And and most people don't know that 95% of prisoners are released. It's just the, the numbers stay high because the recidiv recidivism is so appalling. 